Hi, everybody. This is David Langford again for the Langford Learning Experience. And today, I want to take you on a little journey and introduce you to the founder and CEO of a company called StackUp. So welcome, Nick Garvin. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I ran into Nick a couple years ago, became so excited about the, the product that he had created, especially in this whole world of COVID and online learning. It just seemed like the perfect piece. Um, and I got so excited about it that I sort of signed on with the company to become vice president of education to help promote StackUp because I think it's a vital piece in the whole online world that we're in. So I invited Nick to come on today just to talk about the beginning of Stack Up, where did it come from? Because I think that whole idea and the background of that is really great. And then I plan to do several other videos just talking about what is this product and, and why is it so great? Why is it so necessary in, in this online world of learning that we're working in right now? So Nick, take us back to uh, when you were first even thinking about an idea like this. What was happening with you and what was going on? Yeah, th thanks, David. Um, so at the 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 start of the year, the birth of the idea of Stack Up uh, really does uh, take us back um, quite a few years when I was finishing my formal education, and uh, it was time to start looking for a job. And I was very interested, and I've always been interested in the automotive industry everything cars, car technology, car trends, and so on. Uh, and so I wanted to apply for, job, uh, for a job at Tesla Motors. And when I went to see you know, how I would be positioned or accepted into or even looked at as a potential candidate, I realized that all of my qualifications uh, or passions and interests that would make me a, a good fit for Tesla was all – well, it all happened uh, informally. It wasn't part of my formal education. I had spent hundreds or maybe thousands of hours on the internet, uh, whereas, uh, you know, maybe started reading magazines, but it quickly uh, transitioned to the digital world. So reading about the latest um, car manufacturers, the latest technology, uh, Tesla being one of them, I was frustrated that all of this time learning uh, couldn't be captured. I couldn't showcase it. I couldn't put it on a resume. Uh, and I couldn't just tell them, hey, I love and I'm interested and I'm passionate and I'm educated about the automotive technology uh, and industry world. Trust me. You know, I couldn't just put that on, on my resume. Just trust me. I, I'm really interested because everyone at least says that they are. Yeah, I, I, I think we all really identify with that that we have hobbies, we have interests, all those kinds of things. But uh, if you try to show that to somebody else about what you actually have learned over a period of time, years, months, whatever it might be, it's, it's impossible to do. So I, I can identify with that. Right. And, and so we, you know, went down this path uh, of, of, or I started to go down this path of how do we, you know, is there a technology that already does this? I figured there has to be a way you know, the, the computer and the device is the most powerful, you know, learning device ever made. And with, with access to the internet, uh, we're plugged into the biggest library in existence. Uh, and so I said, well, there has to be a way to capture this. Um, but there, there really wasn't. And so we went down uh, and started talking to lots of great minds um, and started building this technology uh, that is now a patented system that measures real time engaged across the web. Uh, and we do uh, a good job with, with high accuracy of measuring that engaged time. Um, so, so you had this idea and then you started to talk to some people about how this could work. And then what, you just start hiring some programmers and start saying, hey, let's, let's yeah. make this thing. We don't know exactly what it is, but let's start making this thing. Yep, you know, it was really just like, you know, chipping away at something. It was, you know, how, how do you go about doing that? What do you need to do? Uh, you know, are there other technologies that exist that you can borrow pieces of it and parts of it? Um, and, and you just, it, it wasn't one person. It wasn't, uh, it definitely wasn't all me. It wasn't all one uh, particular 
um, developer or engineer. It was just a bunch of minds kind of chipping away at this for quite some time. And, and then we, we formed this, this system um, that has, of course, evolved significantly since we started. And it continues to evolve on a, on a weekly and monthly basis. We, we, we push improvements. Um, so in any entrepreneurial adventure and where the, the entrepreneur is sort of leading this and leading this charge and going through there, you have to have the kind of a single mindedness about where this is headed and what we what we hope to accomplish in, in the future. What, what was driving you to, to really start investing, bringing people together and trying to make this go? I mean, what, what was the big drive beyond just documenting? Yeah. So the, the original uh, uh, value proposition or, or I guess business plan was to successfully quantify all of this learning and time and engaged uh, engagement that we have uh, uh, on the biggest library in existence, the web and, and quantify it into a number or score uh, that could be used to put on your resume an authenticated ah. uh, number. And so that would be uh, used for job seekers and, and on the other side, employers. So uh, it would give uh, Tesla uh, a better look and understanding of, of, you know, they might get thousands of applications, you know, great, highly educated individuals, but how do they pick out those passionate, interested, and truly uh, 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 the best? Yeah, the best so the I, idea would be like if I was inter interested in medicine and I did all this massive study and then I went to apply for a job in the medical field, I would get a score of what, like 88? And what would that tell somebody? Yeah, so we, we had, a, we had a, a, an overly complicated scoring system that we <laughs> thought was pretty clever. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the idea was, and in, in some ways still is, is that uh, an employer on the other side would be able to make better hiring decisions. And there is an abundance of data that uh, at, at the time, this was years ago, about $150 billion annually uh, is just wasted on mishiring, on just mismatches. So hiring the wrong person. And passion and interest um, has become just this really um, important indicator for, for good fits. So there's, you know, rivaling uh, uh, IQ is EQ, emotional uh, quotient, um, and, uh, and PQ, passion quotient. And Thomas Friedman even wrote for the New York Times uh, uh, many, many years now back that, that PQ uh, and, and CQ, curiosity quotient, is another one, uh, rival IQ in terms of success in the job uh, and on the job. So we really so felt this, like that was an important component. Yeah, so this would be a, a way that you could document that passion, that there, right. there's really no other way to do that. I know in my teachings, uh, we teach uh, uh, people how to make portfolios in classrooms and teachers made portfolios. And basically, that, that's what we were trying to do is just document all the stuff you're learning. And here's this three ring folder or a yeah. folder online, et cetera. And here's your portfolio. But uh, your idea, you know, really sort of leapfrogs it into the 21st century saying, hey, it's really hard to put uh, that I read an article in a portfolio and make that work. Yeah, we, we were trying to build the, the credit score, you know, for the mind of, of what you do in the digital world. Um, so, so, yeah, kind of fast forwarding here. Um, we, we thought it was amazing and it was amazing. Uh, but what we, we figured out is that employers weren't going to accept this, this new credential being the stack up score until we had, you know, millions, tens of millions of users. Uh, and we weren't going to be able to successfully uh, get millions of users until we had the biggest employers in the world demanding it. So we, we, we had, in many ways, a classic chicken, chicken or the egg problem. Um, but all while we were doing this and deploying and, and very slowly, we, we, we did it uh, in many stages to learn and and quickly rebuild and, and, and change the system, we learned that teachers were gravitating to our product more and more. Um, and we always knew there was another vertical, uh, but we weren't really paying attention Look, to it. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. What, why were teachers gravitating to it? I think that they saw the, the obvious applications uh, and maybe were a little bit ahead of, of employers in, in their interest of measuring all of this informal 
learning uh, and engagement and passion and interest that students are doing on their own. Um, so you had teachers and, saying, saying to you, hey, can, can this measure students? Yeah, online? can I use this in my classroom? Uh, and we were kind of like, yeah, of course, you know, go for it. Um, but then enough knocks on the door, we said, you know what, um, let's, in a classic startup pivot, let's pivot this system because it really wasn't built for K-12. There, there, you know, we hadn't paid you know, overly amount of attention um, to, um, to, sh to sharing within individuals within the platform. And obviously, you know, that needs to be extremely locked down in the K-12 world. Um, and there were certain permissions. We didn't have like a really a teacher version to oversee students. So we said classic startup pivot. Um, this, this could be more, more compelling and, and, and add more value. Um, but what's neat is it, it kept everything intact that we had always set out to do. So it wasn't like a ch change in our, in our mission or our, or our vision. It was just a change in the look and feel of it to make it just uh, work inside of the the uh, paradigm that that is k-12 um, so changed it you know increased all of our uh, uh our data integrity systems our privacy policy built the teacher uh dashboard school leader dashboards and district leader dashboards and pushed in and moved into k-12 um which i should then probably tell you what that means right <laughs> well, I, I love these uh, entrepreneurial st stories, whether we're talking about Steve Jobs starting in his garage or Microsoft or what I, beginnings of companies. And I think it also always has a big impact on the DNA of a company, how they, when a company grows and adds new employees, do they align with that story? Are they on board with that? Do they really, you know, see the, the value in that process? So here you are, uh, you, you've got sort of this online program that will mo monitor or give you feedback on what you've actually studied online. And now you're getting this idea about K-12. So did you start just to start talking to some teachers and say, well, how would you use this in your classroom or, or how would it work? Or how did you start making that pivot? Yeah, so the, the core of our technology, which was uh, successfully measuring online, you know, reading, learning, and engagement uh, uh, fit perfectly into, into K-12. Uh, but then it was, how do, we, how do we keep diving deeper into that and make it even more valuable? Um, and, and that was things uh, that, features that we built um, based on interactions with, with educators such as being able to measure the reading level um, of every article, web page, and program across the web. Um, and then we had already categorized the web, but how do we adjust those categories to be more um, uh, uh, relevant in K-12? Um, so we started changing our categories. Uh, and, and then this, this system really uh, evolved to be this, this learning engagement system. And so now in the K-12 world, uh, you know, we measure all online reading, learning, and engagement in a school or district. And, and, then, and then with that, another feature that was super uh, important was deployment. How do we make it one-click deployment so every, every student in a school or district instantly has stack up? And how do we make it so they don't have to sign in on their own? Because we know, you know, getting, you know, 50,000 kids to sign in with the username or password or even just with a button uh, it can be difficult. So we made auto sign in for every student. Uh, and so all of those features wrapped in is now the, the stack up K-12, uh, uh, you know, learning engagement system, which instantly can be deployed and measure every, uh, every bit of learning and engagement that happens on a school provided uh, or school uh, provided account uh, device. Yeah, I find it uh, ironic that uh, when I first met you and we started having conversations and I think I asked you, had, had you ever been, you, you've never been a teacher or administrator or anything in K-12, yet you were actually doing a stack up kind of learning, learning about, gee, what causes engagement and what, what you know, how do you improve reading time? And all yeah. of a sudden I realized that you were stacking up a massive amount of knowledge that I wish every educator had <laughs> that same yeah. kind of knowledge. Where, where does interest come from? And, and how do you know if, 
you know, your students are reading something online going through that. So, you know, I think that's a, a fantastic thing and, and forms the foundation of why I think StackUp is so successful today in, in monitoring that student interest. You know, yeah, from your, I, yeah, I never thought of that. It, it's a little bit ironic that uh, my, my education stack up scores and, you know, the hundreds of hours uh, stacked, um, you know, and, and, and it was all going down that path of, you know, of understanding even just the uh, part of our nation's crisis in education, that two thirds of K-12 students don't read at grade level. Um, and it was said, well, well, can we help with that? You know, we're really successful at measuring reading time is reading time important? Uh, so then it was another, you know, dozen or a couple dozen hours uh, reading and understanding the research around uh, uh, reading and finding out that the number one indicator uh, to reading ability and reading success is actually simply time. Um, of course, comprehension uh, is, is super important as well. Uh, uh, following up with occasional quizzes and and uh, and tests can be required, but reading time is the actually paramount. Um, so stuff like that. But yeah, I do have a, a stack up score, but no formal. Uh, aside teaching a little, uh, teaching for a few summers, no formal uh, uh, education or or hands on experience. Uh, in case so today, the the stack up <coughs> program when deployed, you can immediately student you can immediately get insights into not only what students are interested in, you can understand, are they engaged in what they're reading? And you can understand exactly how much time they've spent in a particular program on time or reading an article. Is that, that correct? Is that something? Yeah, that, that sums it up. It can be hard to say it in one sentence because uh, who you are, uh, your, your, your role in the K-12 environment uh, changes what you do and you, the value that you gain from StackUp. But we take our core technology, which is measuring online reading, learning, and engagement by reading level, by category, uh, and time spent, and we present those in visualized dashboards to school leaders to, or to district leaders like superintendents, to school leaders like principals, teachers, and then even students. Students play a huge part in this too, of understanding their own um, uh, uh, digital footprint and and being able to showcase, hey, look what I'm doing. Uh, and, and we've always been focused on capturing and showcasing the good. Uh, we're, we're, we're not really interested um, or focused on, you know, saying here's bad, here's what games were, were being played on online. Um, it's really about all of the good and helping uh, not only find that, which are, we do have some tools for that, but also showcasing it. So we only have a few minutes left in this first segment, and I want to kind of zero in on something I find, uh, I, well, I did, I found very fascinating when I got introduced to StackUp because um, you talked a little bit about it at the beginning that here we have this World Wide Web and we have the access now to the biggest library of materials man has ever known. And yet, what are we doing in classrooms? We're still giving, uh, you know, read this tomorrow, on page 66 or go to this website and read this article. But we're not really unpacking and, and tapping into everything that the web has to offer. And yeah. so how, how did you go about sort of uh, tweaking stack up to tap into that worldwide library? So what, yeah. what have you done there? Yeah. So it's understandable what you said that is is general and standard practice because teachers can't just unleash students to go read and learn on their own and and then have no accountability so we kind of check that first box by saying well no you can allow students freedom of choice and, and allow them to read what what they want um and stack up will be there for you as that the educator to, to give you that accountability on the other side students can can find stuff that truly interests them um, but the, the internet and the OER, the open educational resources are abundant and, 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 and enormous. And, and if you just Google, uh, something that you're interested in, you know, like cars for me, you know, I'm going to get the closest car dealership. I'm not going to get the, the most relevant and interesting article, uh, that might be most interesting to me. So a feature that we did add, uh, is something called the stack up library 
where we are curating and pulling in uh, educational articles from all across the web, um, from places like LiveScience.com to NASA.gov, and we're organizing them by category and subject area and reading level. Um, so we see the library as sort of this launch pad to the biggest library in existence. Um, it's not um, it's not an infinite library, although there are thousands and I think multiple thousands of articles in it. It's to introduce students and teachers to these incredible resources that are absolutely free uh, and 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 are actually infinite or close to it. Um, so so yeah, thanks for asking that. Yeah, it might. It- Uh, work with schools over the last 30 years. I mean, one of the things I really teach a lot about is the neuroscience and the research behind intrinsic motivation. And one of the things we know for sure to be intrinsically intrinsically motivated to learn something, uh, you have to have autonomy or some control over what you're learning. And so as a teacher, if I say, go, go do this, I instantly or take, I'm taking away some intrinsic motivation from that child. But if I can just do a stack up kind of a challenge for learning and just say, hey, you can, you can go read this or go read that. That's, that's a little bit of choice and autonomy. But I can even go bigger, like you're saying, and say, hey, look, go to the library uh, on stack up and I want you to read stuff on aerospace or I want you to read stuff on entrepreneurship and I want you to stack up at least 30 minutes of reading time in that area over the the next four days as your challenge uh, going through that. Now as an individual, wow, the world suddenly opened up to me. I mean, as long as I'm in this kind of category, uh, you know, I'm good. And so now I can start choosing, I can start having that autonomy and moving forward. And I I think that's one of the real powerful things. And then using the technology to to measure engaged time versus asking you to take a quiz right after. I mean, we can all imagine uh, if how much we would love reading if every time we read something, either the news or something that we typically read and we were asked to take a quiz after, uh, it's just less enjoyable and and pretty clearly less enjoyable. But what you said- that, That, what you're just saying, changes teaching significantly. So in the past, the only way I could have, you know, an understanding of did you read something would be to do some kind of comprehension thing, some simple quiz or something like that. Yeah. And that all takes time. But now with stack up, and we know that reading time is also a strong ind- indicator, not only of improving in reading, but improving understanding and comprehension. Mm-hmm. So if I have some good documentation that you've actually read this, I don't have to spend time on, on uh, sort of draconian type tests. And I could spot check that every once in a while and find out, wow, okay, here's 30 kids. If they actually read this and I could give them a test and I could find out that if they read it on, if they stacked up their time on stack up, I got a 90% accuracy that kids kids probably understood that article or they went through that. I don't have to give the test. And that's actually improving overall time and function in classrooms. Yeah. 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 That's, cool. that's a breakthrough. So, all right, Nick, we're going to stop there today and right. I'm going to uh, keep making a sort of some a series of videos, have you back. And then we're going to do some online presentations and demonstrations for people and really kind of seeing the power of stack up. But I just wanted to take this time today have you tell that story. And I think it's very fascinating and very important in this time that we're living in today. So thanks, Nick. Thanks, David. Okay. Bye-bye. See ya.